Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are going to talk about old school magic rules because I'm getting more and more questions from you, the viewer, about the difference uh, between Swedish and Eternal Central rules. So what is the difference? And in this video I'm going to explain that to you and I will also give you some useful links where you can find more information about the different rules and the different rule sets. By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Today I'm going to talk about the Eternal Central Rules, also known as EC, and the Swedish Rules. And at the end I will also briefly discuss the Ravenna Rules, also known as the Italian Rules. Because in many of my videos I say that I'm playing according to Swedish Rules, but with a Ravenna reprint policy. But what, what does that even mean? Well, in this video, you are going to find out. So let's first look at the breakdown. So when we compare EC and Swedish, we're going to look at four factors. We're going to look at the legal sets in each of the rule sets. We're going to look at the reprint policy. We're going to look at the ban and restricted lists. And we're going to discuss notable rule differences. So we'll start off by looking at the legal sets. So the legal sets in EC are Alpha, Beta, Unlimited, Arabian Nights, Antiquities, Legends, Revised, The Dark, and Fallen Empires. In uh, Swedish legal sets, there's only, there are only two differences, and that is that Revised is not legal and Fallen Empire is not legal, as you can see here. Now, this has a huge impact on the actual game, because Fallen Empires, even though it's considered one of the weaker sets, has some very strong cards. The strongest card in Fallen Empire, according to my opinion, and I think I think it's just um, everybody's opinion actually, is Him to Turak. This card, and you can see that here on the left of, your, of the screen, is two black, and it says target player discards two cards at random from his or her hand. If target player does not have enough cards in his or her, uh, his or her entire hand is discarded. Now this card is so powerful. It's a sorcery, by the way, that for two black, you can get card advantage because you give one card and your opponent loses two cards and that's not even all your opponent has to lose the cards at random he or she can't even choose so can you imagine playing with for him to turex so in eternal central the discard decks are much more stronger the mono black is much more stronger thanks to him to turex then in the middle there you see goblin grenade so this is great for goblin builds because you sacrifice a goblin to have goblin grenade deal five damage to one target so in other words to a player because what you want to do with the mono red is deal damage so just for one red you can deal five damage and it's a sorcery so this card single-handedly uh, made goblins a thing in eternal central i don't think it's overpowered though because you do have to sacrifice a goblin and you do need to have a goblin on the field but it is definitely a very strong card and then on the right you see the card river merfolk for two blue you get a two one creature and for one blue you can give it mountain walk now this is not really a powerful creature but i've put it in here because in fallen empires you have a lot of different merfolk such as sea singer and this river merfolk and they make it possible to actually play with a mono blue merfolk deck or play with kind of a counter burn buildup with merfolks because Lord of Atlantis is such a powerful creature. So the reason I'm showing these three cards is to give you an idea of how the meta can completely change by just adding one extra expansion set, in this case Fallen Empires, which is a very small set as well. It, personally, I would enjoy playing EC much more if Hame to Turek would be restricted. I don't really believe in banning cards, but I think if they would restrict him to Turek, for me personally, uh, EC would be a lot more attractive to play. So now that we've looked at the legal sets, we're going to look at the reprint policies. Now this is quite simple, because Swedish format has no reprint policy. You can only play with the sets that I just mentioned, and you cannot play with any others. But Eternal Central has a more liberal approach. So I got this from the eternalcentral.com website. It says tournaments hosted by Eternal Central also allow all non-foil cards from the sets above that were re reprinted in any language with the original frame and original art. So with the sets above, they're referring to the sets that I showed you earlier. So what does it mean when you can play with reprints with the same art and the same frame? 
Well, I've, I've given you an example here on the right. You see the sorts to Plausius from 4th edition. So it's not alpha, beta, unlimited, or revised, but you can still play with it. It's a reprint from 4th edition. And you can play with it because it has the same art and the same frame. Now, on the right side, a little bit at the bottom with the red cross, you see the card sorts to Plausius as well, but this time from the Ice Age. And as you can clearly see, it has a different art. It has flavor text, the original one doesn't have flavor text, um, but it's mainly the art that we're going to focus on. So it has different art. Because it has different art, the sorts to Plausius from Ice Age is not legal, but the sorts to Plausius from 4th edition is legal. So this is very interesting. And because EC allows reprints, it's possible actually to build budget decks in Eternal Central much more uh, it's much more accessible because of that because it's easier you can still build budget decks in Swedish format as well maybe that's something to discuss in another video but because of the EC ruling it's easier to build budget decks with uh, when you play Eternal Central so now let's look at the band list in Eternal Central and Swedish well this is quite simple uh, both formats have banned all the cards that are um, connected to the anti-rule. Uh, anti so the anti-rule is an old rule in Magic the Gathering at the start of the game, where before you would play, you would place your top card uh, for anti. So the top card of your deck, you would flip it and show it to your opponent. Your opponent would show the top card as well. Those two cards would go out of the game and they, they were the anti-cards. And the winner of the game would keep both cards. So in that way, you could kind of build your deck. You could gain cards from your opponent. Now, very quickly, uh, people started to dislike this rule very much because you get a very personal kind of connection with your deck. And you don't just want to give a card away or you don't want to have the risk to lose a card. So many people started playing without anti and slowly the anti rule disappeared. So all the cards connected to the anti rule are banned in Eternal Central and Swedish format. Now, one of the things that I really like about these old school formats is that those are the only cards that are banned. So if a card is too powerful, it usually gets restricted. And here you see the restricted cards in both Eternal Central and Swedish because there are some differences. But these cards are restricted in both the formats. And of course, the Power 9 is in there. So you can only play with one Mox of each. You can only play with one Black Lotus. Uh, you can only play with one Ancestral Recall, which is already you know, ridiculously strong. You can only play with one Demonic Tutor. Um, so these are the cards that are restricted in both the rule sets. Now let's look at the differences uh, between the restricted cards in EC and Swedish. So with EC we see that you're only allowed to play with one Maze of If and one Recall. And in Swedish you're allowed to play with only one Mishra's Workshop, one Strip Mine and one Sherazad. Now before I'm going to talk about Strip Mine because I think that's the the card with the biggest impact on the meta. I first would like to discuss the other cards briefly. So we see Mace of If and Recall at EC rules. And what I find interesting is that Recall has been recently unbanned according to the by the Swedish rules. And then that's always an interesting moment. So you, you're questioning yourself, are we now going to see a lot of decks that play two recalls, three recalls, maybe even a play set? And will those decks be very dominant? And I believe that so far the answer is no. So to me, that's kind of evidence that it was okay to unrestrict a card um, because you would restrict a card if you say the card is too powerful and is unbalancing the meta in a way so certain decks all of a sudden cannot be played if this card isn't restricted anymore or certain decks become too dominant when this card is no longer restricted we don't really see that with recall now maze of if is still a little bit of a question mark uh, in ec rules you're only allowed to play with one in swedish rules you can play with a play set it is a very controlling card um, but again when i'm looking at the results i don't really see any decks that play four maze of ifs that are very dominant on the other hand, you do see decks that play two Maze of Ifs and maybe having one on the sideboard when, they, um, when they're playing against creature-heavy decks. So that's still a bit of a, of a question mark, but it, it didn't have a huge impact on the Swedish format. Um, when we look at the Swedish restricted card, we see restricted cards, we see uh, Mishra's Workshop um, as one of them. 
Now, Mishra's workshop is a land from the antiquities, and it reads tap to add three colorless mana to your mana pool, and you can only use this to cast artifacts. So obviously, this is a powerhouse when you're playing with an artifact deck. Tap two Mishra's workshops, and you can uh, play Triskelion, which is one of the most powerful creatures in old school. Um, so I think it, it, it's questionable. It's it's not that when you look at the EC decks that are dominant that you say okay. Uh, decks, they're all decks with four mistress workshops. That's not the case. However, like it is, it is a strong deck. It, it, there is, there are strong decks to be built with a playset of mistress workshops. But I don't really feel that it's it's too strong. At least when you look at the um, the EC rules in the meta. Of course, what you have to keep in mind is that EC rules, you're allowed to play with four strip mines, so you have more answers when somebody plays with four Mishra's workshops. So it's always, you're constantly weighing and looking at the balance. What if I do this? What if I do that? What would the consequence be? And uh, it's it's hard to tell. And then on the right side, you see, you see Sharazad. So Sharazad is a card from the Arabian Nights expansion. It's for two white. And it's, it's a very interesting card because when you play this card, I'm not going to read all the text to you, but basically what it does when you play this card, you have to play a side game. And whoever wins the side game, or actually I should say whoever loses the side game, loses half of their lives. Now, Sharazad is an interesting card. It's, it's maybe even one of my favorite cards in the game because it's just so old school. It's so ridiculous. All of a sudden you're playing a side game. But... The problem with tournaments is when you're playing with Sharazad and you would play with a full playset, it's really difficult to play within the restraints of the time limit that you usually have in tournaments. So games are stretching too long and all you're going to do is uh, play draws. And sometimes it's even used as a technique to play a draw, you know, by, by, some, by some people. I don't know why you would do that. It sounds kind of, you know, silly. Um, but you could use it to do that. So you could say, okay, I'm gonna put four Sharazad in my sideboard, and then after I've won the first game, board my Sharazads in just to stall the games. Uh, not very not very nice, obviously. I mean, you're a bit of a, uh, yeah, you know, a douchebag. But it, it, it is, theoretically, it is possible. I, I feel that Sharazad restricting the card doesn't have a huge impact on at least tournament play. And then in the middle of the Swedish cards there, because you see three in the middle, there's the strip mine. And the strip mine I really would like to talk about because this has a big impact. And there have been a lot of discussions about strip mine. People have said you need for strip mine uh, when you're playing with Library of Alexandria, when you're playing with Mishra's Factories, when you're playing with Mishra's Workshop, when you're playing with Maze of Ifs, when you're playing uh, against so many... Um, decks that are dependent on dual lands are dependent on city of brasses so you kind of need your land removal um now this could be an argument on the other hand swedish players say listen there are so many answers almost every color in magic old school has land removal stone rain ice storm um you know uh, we sinkhole you know there there are many examples and you also you have other ways to deal with lands for instance a chaos orb you can use a city in a bottle to get rid of a library of alexandria so it's a it's a huge discussion eventually it's obviously up to you as a player when you're playing both formats to say okay i enjoy playing a format with four strip mines or, or not for me personally one of the interesting uh, things questions that i ask myself is okay what what is the impact of strip mine on the playability of enjoying a game of magic and I, I found this bar chart that you see here in front of you and it shows your chance on a mana screw turn two mana screw when you're on the play or on the draw when you're playing with four strip mines so as you can see when you're on the play it's actually more than 20 percent that's your chance on the turn two mana screw and for the ones who are not familiar with that term mana screw basically means you're not drawing enough land enough mana um, so you cannot play your cards, so you just have to wait until you get more mana. And mana obviously can also be a soul ring, a mox, a mana vault, but mana screw means you don't have enough mana to play the game. Now, obviously, magic is no fun if you cannot play spells, if you cannot do anything. So maybe it's fun for your opponent because your opponent is controlling the board, but even for your opponent, if it happens too often, it's not fun anymore. What if, what if magic would just be a game of... 
You know, one person has complete control and the other person can do nothing and that's it. That's it. You know, and I feel that strip mine has, has a really big impact on that. It kind of, I wouldn't say completely, but it makes the game more of uh, a probability game, you know. So, because you're both playing with four strip mines. So, whoever gets the strip mines uh, first or gets the strip mines at exactly the right time, uh, that kind of determines the game. And in, in my opinion, a card should be restricted when the effect of the card is is too big, you know. So, when the effect of a strip mine is too big on the on the format that being said um i can't imagine when you're used to playing with four strip mine and everybody's playing with four strip mine and you're building your deck based on hey i'm probably going to see four strip mine then you keep that in the back of your hat so maybe you're playing with more mana maybe you're playing with other tricks maybe you're consciously um, or maybe you make a choice not to play with the four strip mine because it does cost you a land drop you know so and you also lose a land because you have to sacrifice your strip mine. So the, I, I do feel that there are ways around the strip mine, but I thought that this bar chart really kind of shows the problem that players have with playing with for strip mine, and it's purely based on playability. And also when we think back about Fallen Empires and the card Him to Turek that we discussed, that's actually the same story because it's such a a good card where you take cards from, from your opponent's hand at random, two cards, so a two for one, um, it, it can kind of lead to games, and I've, I've played those games, because I play EC from time to time as well, it's, it's always interesting to play different formats, um, I mean different rule, play according to different rule sets, uh, but what happens from time to time is your opponent plays his for him to Turex, so there are no cards in your hand, then your opponent starts to strip your lands. So you end, you end up with literally no, no cards in your hand, no cards on the board, and you're on zero. You can also do that to your opponent, of course. But, um, you know, that's kind of, for me, that, that happens more in Eternal Central than that it happens in Swedish Old School. Now, don't get me wrong, it does happen in Swedish Old School as well. And, and many of us know how frustrating it can be to play against a deck like a good the deck player and okay you have maybe have some lands on the field woohoo but as soon as you play out a meaningful card it gets countered or it gets disenchanted or it gets sourced or it gets you know that's the whole idea of the deck you know you're, you're doing nothing and your opponent is just waiting uh, or actually your opponent is doing nothing and waiting on you to play something and respond to that and just making it impossible for you to play so there's always this this balance between, you know, let's play magic and and trying to control the match and also just having a fun game. So for me personally, I think four strip mine is a bit too much. Uh, but like I said, when you're used to it and when you're building with this four strip mines in the back of your head, I'm, I'm sure you can build quite successful and enjoyable decks with uh, the, with the four strip mines in there. And then we're going to look at the notable rule differences um, in Eternal Central. Um, because, well, or you can look at it in both ways. Uh, is, it, is it different? It, where Eternal Central is different from Swedish? I think the biggest difference here is mana burn. So mana burn still happens in Eternal Central. And that means that a player loses one point of life for each unused mana in the mana pool at the end of each phase. Now this also has an impact on the game because there are certain cards that are connected to the mana burn rule and here you can see the example of power search and it reads at the beginning of a player's turn before the untapped phase the player must take a counter for each of his or her lands that is not tapped so that's so funny you have to take counters first then during the player's upkeep power search does one damage to that player for each counter the counters are then discarded i just love this in in old school like you have you gotta get your your bag of marbles, you know, aka counters, and you have got to put them on the table, and then after your untap, untap phase, obviously you have your upkeep, and then you have to take a damage for each uh, counter. So in theory, you could do something with those counters. I don't think you can really, but in theory, in theory. So as you can see, power search is useful when you play Eternal Central because then you have you you don't just tap your lands, you don't just drain the mana out of your lands for nothing because you'll get damage. That's what mana burn is. But when you play Power Search in Swedish rules, your opponent can simply say, 
okay, I'll just tap all my land and I'm not taking any damage for them because we don't play with mana burn. And then I untap all my land, so I don't get any counters from Power Surge. So that's a big difference. But maybe a bigger difference, because Power Surge is, is not a very popular card in EC. A very popular card in Swedish and EC actually is Suchi. And Suchi is an artifact creature for, for a 4-4. Four, four. So extremely useful and strong in old school. I mean, for, for 4 mana, a 4-4. Four, four, very powerful. But it has a, well, you could say a drawback, and it can sometimes be... Uh, be a plus as well. It says if Suchi goes to the graveyard, its controller gains four colorless mana. Now, this may sound like great, hey, you're getting four mana, but you attack and your opponent plays a Shatter or a Disenchant or a Swords. Uh, not a Swords because it doesn't go to the graveyard, but anyway, it, it removes Suchi from the game in your combat phase. Then all of a sudden, you're getting four mana that you need to use in, um, in instant speed with instant speed spells or abilities. So if you cannot use those four mana, you get four damage because you're not using your mana and you're getting mana burn. So potentially this creature is a 4444, but when it's removed, uh, I mean when it's killed, it can also give you four damage. And that kind of was a balance when they designed the card and that balance is still there in Eternal Central Ruling, but it's not there uh, in Swedish Ruling. So you know that that is definitely a difference and that's why Suchi is stronger considered to be stronger in Swedish than in Eternal Central. Now, obviously, with Suchi, and if, if you play old school, you know this, there are a lot of ways to use that four mana. My personal favorite way is to use it on a tome. So get the four mana, use it for my tome to tap and draw a card, or use my four mana to drain into a factory, Mistress Factory. But there are other options to work with the Suchi as well. So I believe um, it's still very playable in Eternal Central, despite the mana burn rule. I, I actually think it's it's a nice balance. You know, it, it, it makes the card more balanced because trust me, in old school, a for four mana, a four four is just very powerful. So now that we've looked at the differences between eternal central rules and Swedish rules, I quickly would like to refer, uh, talk about the Ravenna rules. And I'd like to do this because in many of the games that you see on my channel, we are playing according to Swedish rules, but we have a Ravenna reprint policy. Now, what does that mean? Now, in a nutshell, you can see that here, it has the same banner restricted list as Swedish, and um, it says with some reprint versions of the cards legal, and additional reprints are allowed. So same art as the original printing, have the same frame as the original printing, and are not foiled. Uh, all languages are legal. So actually the Ravenna reprint policy looks a lot like the reprint policy of Eternal Central. And there are two exceptions because it says same art as the original printing, uh, but there are two cards in Revised that have a different printing and that's Plateau and Surrendip Afrit. Now both cards are still legal uh, to play when you're playing according to Ravenna reprint policy. And of course they're legal in Eternal Central because Revised is one of the sets that you can play with. You know, Revised and Fallen Empires are the two sets that are legal in EC and are not legal in Swedish. So just to recap, I've made this table where you can really clear, clearly see the differences between EC rules and Swedish rules. And, you know, when we're saying playing according to Swedish rules, but with the Ravenna reprint policy, what we're saying is that you can play with cards that have the same art in the same frame. So you can play with a Sheevan Dragon 5th uh, edition, because it has the same art as the original Sheevan Dragon and Alpha. Uh, you can play with the Sylvan Library from the 4th edition, so you don't have to have the Legends one. Now, the uh, advantage of this more lenient reprint policy is that it's more accessible for more players and you know you can see that in tournament numbers when you're saying we're doing strictly Swedish you're more likely to have a smaller crowd that will come to the tournament simply because the cards they have are not legal especially talking about dual lands when you look at the price differences between revised dual lands and unlimited dual lands I mean it's huge I mean, if you have them, it's great, but if you don't have them and you're a new player and you'd like to enjoy this format, then it's it's really more accessible when you're saying, okay, we're going to do Swedish rules with Ravenna reprint uh, policy. So this was the uh, my video about the differences between Eternal Central rules and Swedish rules. 
I know that there are different um, rule sets out there that are also very popular, like for instance, the Atlantic rule set format or channel fireball uh, format. So uh, UK rules, I believe as well. Uh, what I'll do, I'll put some links uh, in the comment section that you can find more information about all the different rule sets. And here you can see the sources that I've used. So the pages, again, I will put links to these pages in the comment section below so that you can read more about the rules and learn more about all the different formats. And in the end, it is a player based format, meaning that the people you play with in your region, you can decide, do I want to play Eternal Central? Do I want to play Swedish? Do I want to play Atlantic? Do I want to play UK rules? Do I want to play Channel Fireball rules? Do I want to play Ravenna rules? It's up to you. But obviously, it's good to at least know the rules before you make a decision and to test and, you know, even maybe change it from time to time. Say, hey, now I'm going to play EC and I'm going to play Swedish and I'm going to play Atlantic. And, uh, that's also interesting and maybe you can get different decks built for different formats anyway uh for now thank you for watching this episode of timmy talks the channel where we talk old school magic and if you'd like to see some old school magic in action you can click on the links that are appearing right now and for now thank you for watching don't forget to like and see you next time <laughs>